Well, today's episode is all about the numbers, and we're going to explore the importance of having verifiable data for fashion and clothing brands, as well as for retailers. They are all eager to embrace ever more sustainable business practices. So I'm joined today by Deepika Mishra, who is a global sustainability specialist, part of the US Cotton Trust Protocol. Deepika, hello. And you are no stranger to this podcast because we have met before on an earlier episode. But first of all, tell us just a little bit about yourself, your background and your link to the Cotton Trust Protocol. Hi, Kathy. Um, thank you for having me here. Like you said, this is not my first one. I'm really excited and thrilled to be here back again. Um, so a little bit about myself. I currently work as a global sustainability consultant. Um, and one of the areas I'm responsible in trust protocol is analyzing and reporting the sustainability data. Uh, I have a PhD in plant and soil science from Texas Tech uh, University, uh, specializing in agronomy, breeding, genetics. Um, also have 10 years, over, over 10 years of experience in both row and cover crop production. In fact, prior to Trust Protocol, I was working towards domestication of a wild native plant as a cover crop. Uh, I was raised in India, but I was educated in the United States. And that kind of puts me in an advantage of giving me a unique perspective on a global sustainable practices. Absolutely. And you're based in Seattle, I know, which is quite away from the, the, the cotton growing area, but you are keeping monitoring from there. Um, now, I know that anybody listening or watching this probably does already know what the US Cotton Trust Protocol is. But in case not, tell us a little bit what it is and what it does. Yeah, um, US Cotton Trust Protocol, it was launched in 2020. And it was literally the first to deliver full article level supply chain transparency. It's also a program that is built on foundation of uh, science-based uh, data capture targets, aggregation, reporting, and that drives base, the core foundation, in fact, of Trust Protocol is continuous improvement, which is captured across six key sustainability metrics. These metrics are water use, land use, energy use, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, soil carbon, soil conservation. And what happens this, with this data, this unique approach, what it helps growers to measure the environmental impacts, which is the short term gain, and then the outcomes, which is the long term gain, not only of their operation, but also identify certain opportunities that is required for the continuous improvement which also in turn allows brands and retailers to identify certain opportunities and in fact written report on their own sustainability efforts by the help of the aggregate data and again ultimately if you look at it it helps all of us to improve the environmental footprint of cotton production so those six metrics we're going to look at in more detail a little bit later on. But let's just turn the clock back a little bit. So the program launched in 2020. Um, I guess the first thing was to enroll members, uh, the growers themselves, the manufacturers, uh, the brands. So tell us how that has been going. Yeah, um, so the way that, like I was saying, Trust Protocol is unique in a way that it encompasses the growers meals and manufacturers and the brands and retailers. So the grower participation, the first year when it was launched in 2020, we had 625,000 cotton acres. The data that came from was from 625,000. And literally in 2021, the grower participation doubled with 1.1 million cotton acres. And again, all this 1.1 million cotton acres, it came from 17 cotton growing states. And again, as the data, the literally as the data doubled up, 
you can think of it, it gave us a much more fair representation of the data because you're covering the entire cotton growing states. You're capturing the weather conditions, you're capturing the way the farming is done. So it kind of gave that unique perspective. Moving to the meals and manufacturer, uh, the membership have, I, I think it has been the latest as of today, it has been more than 1000 companies. And in fact, from all the different 30 countries that literally, again, it also increased by 50% from last year. And uh, moving to brands and retailers, uh, we are currently the program, as of today, it counts at 40 international brand and retailer members. And some of them, including uh, Gap, uh, Levi's, J. Crew. Um, Tommy Hilfiger, and I can go on. Again, more details, all of this is in our Trust Protocol website. Uh, but again, this is just an overview. So the name is getting known, and the fact that you that there are big brands like that involved is quite something, isn't it? I mean, and what is it that really uh, brings those brands, those, those big names into the uh, Cotton Trust Protocol? Yeah, and if I have to sum it up in one word, I would say it's credibility. Um, of course, which again, accountability follows after the credibility. Currently, the world that we are living in, everybody wants to be transparent. And this sustainability, and that brings on more and more sustainability challenges. If you remember, it's not even a decade, which was actually in 2015, since the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals were developed. And since then, from the recent Green Claims Initiative to the new Federal Trade Commission guidelines around the world, it has moved to increase scrutiny when accusations of greenwashing and that can persist, and it is therefore critical for brands and retailers to ensure to substantiate the claims. And this is where trust protocol fits right in. The traceability, the transparency, accessible to verifiable, reliable data. And it's very important just to be transparent. And of course, when you get big names like that, then the smaller ones also come along and other big names too. So it has a, a sort of rolling effect. So let's get back to the data then, which is really what we're talking about in this episode. Um, we talked about the importance of growing the, the membership in the first year. So year two, you've got data coming in. Does that mean that growers can start to use it to measure and improve their performance? Uh, yes, actually, uh, what currently the way we have it in trust protocol, like we publish our annual report, we publish one for the public version, we publish another version for our members, and we have a separate ver version for the growers. So actually, before that, let me put a little bit of highlight what the annual report consists of. So um, again, that's the aggregated farm level data and it represents all the 17 cotton growing states. And um, yeah, and in fact, it also encompasses the 258 counties. And the way we aggregate is we basically um, put a weight, weighted average, which is harvested across all the individual metrics. Um, and what we do is in the public version, we provide just the aggregate data for the six metrics. In the member version, we provide the statistics with that, which we provided in year two. And also for growers, when you ask the question what it means for the growers, growers get a personalized report year on year, a comparison of their overall farm, a state, like the state they belong to at a program level and at a national level. So they get to have three comparisons, not only for the 119 self-assessment questionnaires, also for the field print data. And the data itself is actually anonymized though, isn't it? And, um, so you can't sort of see what your neighbor is doing or what somebody's no. doing in an, another state. Absolutely, absolutely. In this world of data consent and data privacy, yes, we definitely do respect that. And at the same time, um, no one other than the grower itself cannot see that, like they literally no one can see their scores other than themselves. So let's look at those metrics. You've talked about these six metrics. Let's look at them one by one. Um, and let's start with land use. Yeah, um, if you 
think about land use, it's again, if I have to say in one sentence, it's literally just the inverse of yield. So what does that truly mean? Uh, cotton yield is measured as a quantity of raw cotton fiber, which is harvested per acre. Usually the when we report it, it's pounds per acre. And this land use is heavily influenced not only by genetic components, but also environmental components. And it has got multitude of factors, such as length of the growing season, the climate. I mean, it go, it's like including the solar radiation, temperature, light, wind, rainfall, dew. What type of cultivar are you planting? Availability of nutrients. And again, due to the inherent biology of cotton plant, which is a woody, it's a perennial, it has its priority is survival rather than productivity, especially when it senses environmental limitations. So the yield is both environment and genetics that contribute to the variation. And it's, it's very complex. Um, moving to the trust protocol, the way we measure it in trust protocol in 2015, the baseline for land use, it was at 48 square feet required for producing a pound of cotton. In 2021, the growers, and again, our 2025 goal is to increase the land use efficiency by 13%. In 2021, the grower members used 41 square feet of the same amount of cotton, which is, if you do it in percentage, it's actually 16% improvement. So we are, the growers in the trust protocol are tending in the right direction. I like the fact that you say the pri priority is survival for the cotton plants. Um, but so if the land use is, is less, does it mean more cotton is being produced overall or is the land being used for uh, other things, for food, for instance? Yeah, it's, it's, it's to your first point. Like overall, if the land use is less, there is more cotton produced per acre versus when you go, when you plant in a land where you, for example, if the yield is thousand pounds per acre, and then you have a land uh, where the yield is 500 pounds per acre, both are using the same area, but the yield difference is 500. So which means the land where 1000 pounds per acre yield is, it has more potential, it used less land versus the one with 500 pounds per acre. Yep. So, so the trust protocols set specific goals for water efficiency and how does reality bear out in relation to the goals? Yeah. Um, the 2025 goal for water use efficiency, uh, which again, I'd say it's of ambitious goals, but at the same time with the novel techniques that is used by the trust protocol growers. Um, and initially when these goals were set, the 2025 goal was to in increase the efficiency by 18%. If you look at the data in 2021, the trust protocol, they grow, the growers improved efficiency by 14% meaning they use less water in comparison to 2015. And also with the application, another way to describe this is with the application of similar points of water, there was more gain in the cotton fiber in 2021 versus in 2015. Okay, so also work, moving in the right direction, that's fantastic. So energy use. Now, I presume that with the price of energy, we're feeling it all in so many different parts of the world. But with the price, price of energy going up, there is a huge incentive to reduce energy use. So uh, what are you seeing in the cotton world? Yeah, one of the areas actually we saw uh, quite a bit of improvement, which is important in today's world as we talk about emissions. Energy and emissions are very closely related. And I'm going to talk more about it in the emissions area. But again, just to move back to energy use, we saw a huge improvement in energy use, meaning in um, our goal for energy use, our sustainability goal for energy was to redu reduce by 15%. If you look at the data, the trust protocol growers have actually reduced energy use by 25%, even surpassing the 2025 goal. And the way the energy use metric is calculated, it's from pre-planting 
do post harvesting basically as the grower goes in the field to uh, prepare for planting until the bale reaches the ginning even after ginning so energy use encompasses all the data points in between that and from tilling fertilization uh, water management improved breeding and genetics and especially uh, efficient tractors uh, by John Deere, you know, and which helps in reducing fuel use, growers have explored how to use less energy and in fact, improve their environmental footprint over time. So of course, if you're using less energy, there are uh, fewer greenhouse gases, which is the next metric that you are um, you're looking at, but it's, it's not just energy use, is it? So that, tell us a bit more about that metric. Yeah, so the greenhouse gas metric, um, again, let me describe where it comes from, how we capture it. So there are three main sources. When we account greenhouse gas emissions, these three sources, one comes from your uh, tractor, your diesel, your or your electricity, any form of energy that you're applying. Uh, second comes from biological nutrient recycling, especially in through your fertilizer, fertilizer, fertilizers, which releases nitrous oxide. And at the same time, it's some of them in cotton, we don't release methane, but if you look at rice production, they release a lot of methane. Um, and that's also taken into account. And the third is lowering basically emissions when the crops is burnt after the harvest. And in US, it's not a common practice in cotton. So for us, what's important where we can target is the very first one by reducing the amount of energy in form of diesel or electricity. And the way you can do it, for example, if you are currently practicing conventional tillage, you're using more energy versus if you are doing no till, you're actually not using any energy to do uh, any kind of practices. So in a way you can see that all these practices, if you do more and more farming operations, machinery, then it directly kind of correlates to the greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, one thing to note, nitrous oxide is 296 times more deadlier than carbon dioxide. And that directly comes from the fertilizers. And we have seen in our data, 45% of the greenhouse gas emissions comes from uh, fertilizers, literally using the fertilizer straight. And uh, our goal, we have a goal to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by 39%. In 2021, we saw the greenhouse gas emissions, and again, on an aggregate level for trust protocol growers, is um, they have, in fact, decrease the greenhouse gas emission by 21%, which is, again, setting the right foot towards the goal of decreasing greenhouse gas emissions by 39%. So it's not just carbon in the air, Deepika, that, that we're talking about, because you mentioned that soil carbon retention is also another of your metrics. So tell us about that. Yeah. Um, again, just to build the foundation a little bit, if you think about soil health is a very key core component. Healthy soil is the foundation of productive and sustainable that we are talking about and sustainable agriculture. It is critical to support our water infiltration, meaning how much water is absorbed into the soil, not that it will saturate it so that, you know, the soil just, the water just seeps in, but it depends on supporting that infiltration how much the soil based on the soil health it also depends how much it can how much nutrient it can hold so which we call in agronomy or nutrient holding capacity and also crop productivity for both carbon storage sequestration and helping that carbon to be utilized in much more efficient manner and to track all this in trust protocol, we use something called the soil carbon metric, which is a soil conditioning index. And what it represents is under the current production practices, what is your soil health, whether you have more organic matter or is your organic matter depleting or it is an addition to your organic matter or it is an increase in your organic matter. 
The soil conditioning index, the way we calculate it, it ranges from minus one to plus one. If the index, if your soil health, particularly in one certain field, if it's negative, soil organic matter levels are predicted to decline under the current production system, meaning you need to do some kind of enhancement where you can drive a positive index. And if the index value is in positive, it means that the organic matter levels are predicted to increase under the current system. And in fact, in 2021, 70% uh, of the trust protocol members, they had a positive index value, meaning under the current production system that they have been doing, their soil health is well maintained. And again, it's through planting cover crop uh, and it's through practicing no-till, not disturbing the soil. And what that does, it, the growers, by doing all this practice, uh, and again, one important thing is crop rotation. When the growers uh, practice uh, this on the field, they protect the soil structure. And also a huge part is they encourage the soil biodiversity, the microorganisms, flora and fauna, to seep through. And so overall, then, you're looking at soil health, not just the carbon retention, but you're looking generally at soil health as your final metric. Um, so, I mean, are there different techniques for this? Tell us some more about that. Yeah, so it all, again, it all depends. It's like uh, garbage in, garbage out. What you do to your field, that's what the result you get out of. So, and again, this includes various field operations, like I was saying, tillage methods. If you are practicing no-till, where you are not disturbing the soil and there is some residue in the soil, then there is a better soil microbiodiversity that directly influences the soil health. If you are practicing crop rotation. So what happens, there are certain type of crops, um, they, kind of exuded a type of substance which we come as allelopathy it's like signaling like a neural responsing in between the plants if they start releasing if there are more and more release of that exudates then there is in comparison we have seen less yields less uh, weeds and what that does is the plant itself puts like a defense structure to protect itself from weeds and that in, with that, the soil health gets improved. As there are different type of rotation, again, the flora and fauna gets improved, the type of crop type, what type of irrigation system. And one important thing in soil health is uh, inherent fields, physical features. So currently, uh, the way it's calculated, it's called a universal soil loss equation. And in this, there is historic climate data with the slope of the field, the slope length, and the soil texture, texture that is associated. And it's kind of stored in a national database. When we get these numbers, when we get a soil conservation or a soil, loss, no, soil loss numbers, that national database is referred. And then using a wind based predicting system, wind erosion predicting system, and a water erosion predicting system, we predict the net soil loss, not only for wind, also water. And then we total it together, and that's how we get the soil conservation. And um, actually for trust protocol growers, uh, when we were doing the 2015 baseline, the soil loss was at 12.6 tons per acre per year, which you can, um, if you, converted into a size system, it's 35 metric tons per hectare. And the goal is to reduce by 50% by 2025. So far, the trust protocols have done a massive progress in this area. Um, they have already cut the soil loss by 78%, which is huge. And this is again through innovative approaches. And it's not like one size fits all. It's every farm is unique in its way and they're doing the most of the practices to get the best output. So overall, I mean, when you give us all these statistics, um, what's your response? I mean, are you, you must be very happy, of course. Is it better than you thought? 
Yeah, so I mean, it's it's like sometimes when I start reporting data, I kind of get nervous. I'm like, wow, this is huge, huge, like a lot of improvement that we saw in two years. And let me remind everyone, this is just a two years data set. Now imagine as we get more and more data, we would be able, and, and that's why, um, so we follow field to market field print calculator. And the way they have is if you want to make any kind of claims, for example, if you're trying to make an impact claim, you need at least five years of data to make any kind of impact. However, because this will be our third year of data currently as we speak, um, we would be able to release some of the trend data this year, which would show how the trend is following towards our impact. And again, um, when I report this data, I'm extremely proud. It's always good to report good data. It's always nice and easy to report um, the way the trend is following in. And year on year data then will soon be available to growers. Yes, it's, it's currently available to growers and that the growers can only see that. What we report in our annual re report, it's basically, um, um, and again, just a little backup, why we did it. So currently, if you see Southwest part of the US in Texas, there is a huge drought going, at, going on. We had a wonderful 2021 year, but in 2022, uh, if you look at the national agricultural statistics, last year, uh, the total harvested acre was 10.2 million. Uh, while this year, even though there was 13.7 million acres planted, only half of them got harvested, which is 7.2 million acres. And um, if you look at those numbers, there is so much weather fluctuations. So reporting a year-on-year -year average, statistically, it doesn't make sense for the brands and retailers. But for our grower members, we have that. We provide them a year-on-year -year data. And like I was mentioning earlier, where they can see where they are with the state, national, and at a program level. Uh, what we provide to our growers, or what we, sorry, what we provide to our brands and retailers, we provide them uh, aggregate data, which is a weighted moving average, and that is based on three years of data. For example, in 2023, they will get an aggregate data of 2020, 2021, and 2022. And why we are doing that. Um, so the weighted moving average, what happens is it puts more weight on the recent data and less on the past data. And especially as we are trying to look for a trend, this is the best calculation methodology that you can use without using any random fluctuations. And like I was saying, there are four important points. It, it allows, um, emphasizing on recent data. It allows more flexibility, meaning you can assign different weights in different data points. For example, if you look at our data set, we have growers who are irrigated, non-irrigated. We have growers where the yield levels are, sometimes it's at 1500, sometimes it's at 300. So again, just to remove all those variations and make it more flexible, we use this approach. And again, this is the most accurate representation that is currently with any kind of methodology. This is the most uh, accurate representation of a trend. And as we are having a lot of data from the 17 cotton growing states, there is a lot of very like lot of variation. Weighted average, it performs better because it can capture that trend. I mean, when you, when you talk about what's happening in Texas and um, you see how terrifying and the, the challenges that the weather can actually present to growers it is quite quite scary um so you've got the goals there from the the cotton trust protocol 2025 you set goals so what will happen in 2025 it's not that long away uh, some of these goals may have been met some may not have been some may have been surpassed some already have been surpassed um so where do we go looking ahead yeah, um, so I, I think previously in my talk, I, I was mentioning, right, and in, when in 2015, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals were formed. Prior to that, in 2000, they had something called Millennium Development Goals. And under the Millennium Development Goals, there were eight goals that they wanted to achieve across all the countries. 
and the point of me saying here, and, and as 2015 came in, after 15 years, they started with the sustainable development goals. They kind of captured both the millennium and sustainable goals. Um, and the reason I'm saying this is these goals, they help you to move forward. They help you to achieve something. They help you to document something. And that's where trust protocol is. Our commitment to transparency, to measuring um, the verifiable data, it's, it still is built in our core foundation. And again, like I was saying in 2021, what I'm talking about is only two years of data. And as more and more data comes in, we will be able to see that continuous improvement. Um, and in fact, uh, in 2021, we launched something called a continuous improvement trend. This is especially for the growers who are with us since the inception of the program. And what we are doing is we are seeing how their improvement has been since they started us, since they started with us from the program. This is very separate from the aggregate report that we publish. Um, again, this is something we provide to our members. Uh, we also provide to our growers um, where they can see what is the continuous improvement over time. And what we are trying to do in trust protocol, honestly, like I was saying, continuous improvement, that's the hallmark of us. And um, industry, the, the entire textile industry, they are already currently working on new goals uh, because we know that if you don't maintain a focus and if you don't implement all this latest technology, communicate all these innovative approaches, it, it, this all are key features for improving on our sustainability metrics and overall helping the industry. And um, key to this is literally as, and there are all the actors in the industry, right? From your growers to brands and retailers. And as, I was, as we were talking about this value chain uh, earlier, it is important to understand the environmental footprint of cotton production. Um, and I think as we are probably coming to the end of our session, this is also a great place to end. What we can do, what we have in control is we can drive the continuous progress. We can improve by reporting it. We can help to engage with it by listening to our partners across the value chain. And also with all these different messages and all these different opportunities, we can use informed thoughtful decisions to meet our realistic and ambitious, I'd say ambitious and realistic goals beyond 2025. You talk about the importance of communication. I remember one cotton grower, it might have actually been on the session that you were with us uh, on earlier. Um, and he said, we're not very good at telling our own story, but now of course with the data, it's it's possible. But I mean, tell us about the, the just very briefly, the, the you talk about dialogue along the value chain. Who's talking to what and what about, and who's leading this dialogue? And uh, you know, just give us a little bit of an insight as as how that really matters. Yeah, yeah, and there are many actors. Like for example, we as an organization, there's so many partners: Soil Health Institute, there is Textile Exchange. So everyone is running towards one simple goal for reducing to basically to meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and the way at least I'm speaking, I'm speaking from the trust protocol perspective, we are continuously using, we have those goals in mind, we are taking all this data, the growers data that the grower is providing voluntarily, we are taking that data, we are narrating out, we are providing that to brands and retailers where they can use in their scope three emissions, they can use in their sustainability reporting, they can also use this in their life cycle assessment, especially when you see from cradle to end of life. And yeah, that's exactly where the trust protocol comes in as a major actor. And also it's, I get the feeling it's sort of like a, a, a brotherhood or a sisterhood or it's a it, you know, support network as well. I mean, you know, yes, it's, yep. it's so important in terms of sustainability, but it's a, it's a brutal world out there. And I think you get the feeling that the growers and the others are, are very ha happy to have this sort of this network. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, honestly, um, when you meet with these growers, when you speak with these growers, there is, this is the platform where there's so much to share in open. 
some of the approaches a grower is doing or some of the new things. It could be a very tiny thing, but that tiny thing, for example, if you use a water certain type of knob in your water faucet, that would help increase water use efficiency more. It's a very tiny thing, but the small, small approaches, the important part is communication, reporting, and staying away from misleading facts. Well, great way to end. Thank you so much, Dupika. That's Dupika Mitra, Special Advisor to the US Cotton Trust Protocol. Thank you very much indeed for joining us from Seattle been really interesting to delve into the data and to see how important it is to measure sustainability performance for the growers and for the brands and for the retailers. So that is it for this episode of the US Cotton Trust Protocol's Smarter Conversations podcast. You can learn more about the Trust Protocol at trustuscotton.org and remember to watch out for the next episode. So it's goodbye from me and goodbye from Topeka. Thank you.